Uh, my name is Dick Van Eyten. I'm from the Department of Philosophy. I'd like to welcome you to this midday panel discussion on the role of the university. We have three panelists. Let me introduce them from my right to left. Reed Crawford on the far right is standing in for Pat Fiedelman from uh, UNI, who's working as a, um, actually, I call her a lobbyist in Des Moines <laughs> for UNI. <laughs> then next to me is Mary Williams, who's a member of the Iowa Board of Regents. Mary's involved with a lot of different important things in the state. Probably one of the activities about which we would be most interested is her work on the um, planning and higher education project as a representative of the Board of Regents. And on my left, my very far left, is Bob Hollinger <laughs> How far? from the philosophy department. We're going to give each one of the panel participants uh, an opportunity to talk 10 to 15 minutes on uh, their perspective on the role of the university within a democracy, and then we'll open the proceedings up to comments and questions and give and go discussion. We'll start with um, uh, Mary, uh, right, we're starting with you. Yeah, we're going to start with Mary Williams, and then we'll go Bob Hollinger, and then we'll come to Reed. Thank you, Dick. It's nice to be here, and I'm very pleased to represent the Board of Regents uh, for this discussion and examination of higher education in a democracy. From my perspective as a regent, I'm involved with the role of public universities in a democracy. And here today in Ames, um, we need to examine the role of a public land-grant university like Iowa State, for it is the land-grant tradition and mission that gives this university a unique responsibility with regard to higher education in a democracy. The land-grant colleges and universities were created specifically to address the higher education needs of groups of people who did not have equal access to higher education. The Morrill Act established a land-grant college in each state. I quote from that legislation, the leading object, object shall be, without excluding other scientific and classical studies, and including military tactics, to teach branches of learning as are related to agriculture and the mechanic arts in such a manner as the legislatures of the states may respectively prescribe in order to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes and the several pursuits and professions in life. Now this landmark legislation was aimed directly at increasing educational opportunity to, underrepresented, to an underrepresented group, and that is the working classes. In the 1890s, the second Morial Act expanded the land grant concept to increase higher education opportunities for African Americans. Today, that land grant concept has been expanded to include making higher education available and accessible to all underrepresented groups, including all minority groups and to groups that are underrepresented in specific areas, such as women in science and engineering. The state of Iowa and Iowa State University have a proud heritage in the land grant tradition. Iowa was the first state to formally adopt the terms of the Land-Grant Act, designating Iowa State as its Land-Grant College. Iowa State was co-educational from the day it opened its doors in 1868, and today, Iowa State University is a leader among institutions of higher education in programs designed to increase the participation of minorities and women. Iowa State has two exemplary alumni role models. One is George Washington Carver, to whom this institute and a year-long series of events at Iowa State are dedicated. Carver paved the way for future generations as Iowa State's first African-American undergraduate and graduate student, earning both a bachelor's and master's degree from Iowa State and working as a scientist with the Agriculture Experiment Station here before leaving to embark on a scientific career at Tuskegee. The other is Carrie Chapman Catt, an 1880 graduate who led the National American Women's Suffrage Association movement to success with the passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, ensuring women the right to vote. She was also the co-founder of the League of Women Voters. As the original legislation states, the responsibility of implement implementing the land-grant philosophy of education in Iowa State rests with the state legislature. Now, in Iowa, the legislature has delegated that responsibility 
along with the many other responsibilities of operating the state pub state's public universities and special schools to a board of regents. I think it would be beneficial to explain briefly the unique role played by the Board of Regents here in Iowa. You may have heard or read the comments of Hunter Rawlings, the president of that other large university in Iowa, the University of Iowa. He has st stated frequently to the board and to Iowa's political leadership that Iowa is indeed fortunate not to have the complex and multi-layered higher education <laughs> governance structure that many other states have. He cites specifically the situation in Colorado, where he previously served, where each institution is governed by a board, and those boards report to a super board. Iowa has one citizen board of regents to govern all three of its public universities, Iowa State, the University of Iowa, and the University of Northern Iowa, and also its two special K-12 residential schools, the Iowa Braille and Sight Saving School in Vinton and the Iowa School for the Deaf in Council Bluffs. The regents are appointed by the governor, subject to confirmation by the Senate. We are appointed at large for six-year terms. However, there are three specific conditions that must be met as far as the overall makeup um, of the board is concerned. First of all, no more than five of the nine members can be from one political party. Secondly, no more than five can be of one gender. And finally, one member must be a student at one of the governed universities at the time he or she is appointed. Our responsibilities are outlined in the Iowa Code, and they are quite broad. The major responsibilities include appointment of all university officials, including the presidents, a process, process which you know is well underway here. Establishment of budgets, setting of tuition and fees, approval of academic programs, and doing whatever else is necessary for the effective operation of the institutions. Now how the regents carry out those responsibilities is really up to the individual boards. In, eight, in 1987, soon after I joined the board, the Regents undertook a new approach to the governance of public higher education in Iowa. We initiated an organizational audit of the entire Regent operations, and one of the outcomes of that audit was the concept of strategic planning, both within and among the Regent institutions. The Regents believe strongly that strategic planning is absolutely essential if Iowa is to have an effective and efficient system of public higher education now and into the 21st century, one that is responsive to Iowa's changing educational and outreach needs. Developing the strategic plans has taken considerable time and energy from hundreds of university faculty, staff, and students during the past several years. But I think that most would agree that the effort has been worthwhile. Today, strategic plans are in place at the regent level, at each university, and at every college within the universities. These plans are already guiding our actions in the governance and operation of the institutions. More importantly, the strategic planning process is ongoing and the plans will be revised regularly in order that the regents and the universities are able to adapt to meet new challenges and opportunities. The regents' overall aspiration is to raise the quality of the institutions to the level of the country's top public universities with similar missions. First, the missions of the institutions have had to be examined. Each university must provide undergraduate students with a broad-based education in the liberal arts tradition. Beyond this, Iowa State University's mission emphasizes the land-grant mission with special emphasis on science and technology. To reach our aspiration, the regents have adopted 12 region-wide goals, each with a set of strategies designed to enable us to accomplish those goals. Each of the institutions have developed strategic plans based on the Regent goals. I'd like to highlight five of those goals which have particular relevance to our discussion here today. The five goals address specifically the issues of quality teaching, undergraduate instruction, accessibility, and diversity. And the goals are as follows. One, to ensure that quality teaching remains a key priority within all Regent institutions. Two, to foster and maintain undergraduate instruction programs of high quality. Three, to attract 
develop and retain faculty, staff, and students high in quality and diverse in composition. Four, to improve access by all Iowans to Regent universities. And five, to escalate the efforts to increase participation of minorities in higher education. I think it's very important to note that the first two strategic goals address quality teaching in undergraduate instruction programs. Each of the university's strategic plans place special emphasis on the importance of teaching and undergraduate education. Each plan includes the development of resource centers to support and improve teaching. At Iowa State, it's called the Center for Teaching Excellence. Now, Iowa State's plan calls for enhanced liberal education components that ensure all undergraduate students, regardless of major, literacy in science and technology, environmental awareness, communication and analytical skills, humane and ethical values, knowledge of the intellectual, historic, and artistic foundations of our culture, and international and multicultural awareness and sensitivity. Each of the colleges at, the, at Iowa State also has its own strategic plan. And again, each emphasizes improving the quality of undergraduate education through such measures as involving more senior faculty in teaching introductory level courses, increasing the diversity of the faculty, and less dependence on <coughs> temporary faculty. This fall, Iowa State implemented a comprehensive program designed to improve the teaching skills of, a te of teaching assistants. The program includes a series of workshops led by faculty and experienced TAs who have been recognized for exceptional teaching. In addition, a handbook for new teaching assistants has been published and is in use. Much remains to be done before we can say we've achieved our goals of ensuring quality teaching and maintaining high quality undergraduate programs. But the strategic plans developed by the regions, the universities, and the colleges provide us with a roadmap to show us the way to success. And they are working. Iowa State also has several programs that have been particularly successful in increasing enrollment among students from minority groups and traditionally underrepresented groups. The success of these programs does not mean that we're doing all that we can to foster and promote diversity in, on campus. However, these programs are excellent models to use as we continue and expand upon our efforts. We have made progress in increasing the number of minority students on the state university campuses. Our goal, which is well known, is to have 8.5% of the university's enrollments be students from minority groups. Total minority enrollment at the Regent Universities today is 3,730 students, the highest it has been in 10 years. Minority enrollment at the University of Iowa is 7.5%. At UNI, it's just over 3%, and at ISU, it is about 5%. These figures show that we still have a way to go, but significant progress is being made. Now much of our success depends upon funding, and I'm pleased to see that the commitment to funding has grown on all levels, the university, the state, and the federal levels. Funding is a day-to-day -day struggle, and I sincerely hope we can not only maintain, but expand the programs which have been particularly successful. Here are a few. The Regent Universities received about one and a half million dollars this fiscal year for the Iowa Minority Academic Grants for Economic Set Success Program, or IMAGES. Under that IMAGES program, 525 minority students received financial assistance, nearly double that of the previous year. At ISU, 159 minority students are receiving assistance under the IMAGES program. The ISU students are honored as George Washington Carver scholars, and they include African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, and Native Americans. Iowa State and the Des Moines Community School District are cooperating in the Science Mentoring Project, which encourages selected ethnic minority students to become interested in the sciences and keeps them on track to pursue science, engineering, or mathematics programs in college. A pilot project with the Merrill Middle School this past year has already generated tremendous enthusiasm among the students and their, fa their ISU faculty mentors. Now this program is being funded with a $400,000 grant from the National Science Foundation, an outside grant. 
Iowa State also has a long-standing partnership with the King Perkins Elementary School in Des Moines to begin encouraging very young students to pursue math and science on through, through college. The emphasis of these programs is positive reinforcement, sending the message that yes, you can do it, no matter what the past might have told you. The Regents are also committed to improving accessibility, both philosophically and physically, to the, I to the state's public institutions. Two of the most successful programs in the nation in attracting and retaining students in area where they have traditionally been significantly underrepresented are here at Iowa State. The Research Careers for Minority Scholars program, directed by Anna Pate, is funded by a five-year, $1.5 million grant from the National Science Foundation to, incur to encourage minority students to consider advanced engineering degrees by involving them in ongoing research projects, internships, and one-on-one -on -one interactions with engineering faculty. Iowa State's Women in Science and Engineering program, directed by Myrna Wiggum, has become a national model in efforts to encourage more women to pursue careers in science and engineering. This program is directed at young people in grades 4 through 12. Last year, personal contacts were made with more than 3,500 young women through on-campus conferences and one-on-one -on -one meetings by some 50 university volunteer role models. These programs in science and engineering are essential, not only to increase diversity at ISU and in these fields, but to also ad address the critical shortage of college and university science and engineering faculty that the nation as a whole is facing. Our nation's future competitiveness in science and technology depends on getting more people, particularly women and minorities, to pursue advanced degrees and be leaders in these fields. A large and growing number of people in our society are differently able, people we used to describe as physically handicapped. More than 1,400 of these students with some identified handicapping condition are currently enrolled at the three universities. Iowa State has also formed partnerships with two historically black universities, Tuskegee and Clark Atlanta, to help them improve the quality of their research capabilities as part of the University Consortium for Research and Development. This partnership continues the wonderful relationship that Iowa State enjoyed with Tuskegee, where George Washington Carver went after earning his undergraduate and master's degree at Iowa State. Now, during his commencement address here in December, Tuskegee President Benjamin Payton reminded us that we still have much to do to achieve what Carver worked so diligently for and devoted his life to. That is to provide high quality and rigorous education for everybody at every level. Payton said, Carver would say first that it's time for those who wish to honor him to make a major commitment to America's young people especially black and minority people, and especially to provide a commitment to science and technology education. And as Iowa State Interim President Milton Glick said following Peyton's speech, we have a long way to go to be the kind of university we want to be. But there is a commitment to make this university inclusive. The reason to educate minorities in the future is not to do it for them, but to do it for us. We can't afford not to. That commitment goes right to the top of the University, the Board of Regents, and the State of Iowa. I'd be happy to answer some questions after the other presentations. Thank you. Thank you. We'll turn next to Bob Hollinger from the Department of Philosophy. I have 10 minutes. Get it done. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the theme, what universities should not be, but unfortunately are becoming. And um, the main thesis of my talk is to the effect that uh, that learning reflection and the critical examination of society is, uh, are on their way out, and that uh, universities are uh, becoming gigantic corporations motivated by greed. And um, OK. Um, what I'm going to do is just sort of itemize a couple of things that I found. The first thing that I want to mention as an item um, well, there are two parts to this. The, the first part uh, comes from a uh, novel called The Mind Body Shop. And um, The Mind Body Shop is about a, a British university, very much like Iowa State University. 
And um, the classics department and the English department have already been abolished because they're not making uh, enough money. And uh, the, uh, the chancellor of the university talks the chair of the philosophy department into uh, going into a storefront that's uh, in a shopping mall owned by the university. And the philosophy chair uh, sends out, uh, I hope Ben Knight's not writing this down. Because this, this is just a novel. All right. Um, the, um, the chair of the philosophy department sends out all the people in the department uh, going from door to door so, uh, trying to sell uh, courses to people. And um, that doesn't work out very well. And uh, it turns out that there's a bordello above the uh, philosophy store uh, in the shopping mall. And the chancellor of the university uh, decides that uh, the philosophy department might make more money if it goes into uh, partnership with the bordello. And uh, the result of that is the mind-body shop. <laughs> this, this gives the mind-body problem a totally new twist. Now, uh, unfortunately, um, this is not entirely fiction. In, in an article called An Idea Whose Time Has Come, I'll just read you this. Um, Cogito ergo sum. Though the phrase might make Rene Descartes think twice, can't do lunch, I'm seeing my philosopher, could soon be the Los Angeles thinking man's lament. It's happening in Amsterdam, where gurus and shrinks are giving way to philosophers who have opened private practices and charged clients up to $50 an hour to kick around profound thoughts. <laughs> There's a new generation of philosophers who want to take part in society, not just work in ivory towers, um, explained one of the people who set this practice up. He predicts the practice will grow because it, he helps people answer very basic questions like who are you and what do you want out of life. Right, so that's the first item. The second item um, concerns the abolition of the uh, Washington University Sociology Department last uh, year. And I think, without going into all the gory details, I think the moral of that story is that Monsanto and Marxism don't mix. But the more general moral of the story is that um, uh, people who have a reputation for wanting to raise critical questions about what's going on in certain environments uh, will not be tolerated. All right. The third um, item I want to refer to is, a, is a, uh, an editorial in science magazine called Knowledge is Real Estate. All right. Uh, the basic idea is that knowledge has now become uh, an economic commodity. It's variously called real estate or intellectual property. And um, the gist of the, uh, the idea is that um, uh, one can uh, uh, turn uh, knowledge into an economic commodity, which of course is privately owned uh, and is um, bought and sold. Uh, the next uh, item on my list is uh, an ad I saw in the Chronicle of Higher Education. It's an ad for an assistant professor in entrepreneurship. And um, the, Wichita, the Wichita State University Center for Entrepreneurship is seeking an assistant professor in entrepreneurship to teach two entrepreneurship courses each semester and blah, blah, blah. Um, there's also um, a friend of mine sent me a, 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 a blurb on uh, an article which is entitled, uh, which talks about the establishment of a Taco Bell Distinguished Professorship <laughs> at Washington State University. And the man who was appointed the, uh, the, pre the first distinguished professor is the CEO of Shakey's. Uh, and um, <laughs> the University of Michigan is, is now giving $25,000 uh, fellowships to humanities professors in entrepreneurship. All right. Uh, the last item is uh, from the uh, AAUP journal uh, Academe. They had a recent issue called the Entrepreneurial University. Just let me quote some of the things they say. Um, as universities become more like businesses, they risk squandering the academic loyalty and public support on which they depend. If the campus culture is distorted by placing an imprimatur on the pursuit of profit, the gains may be small compared to the losses. Um, some of the more entrepreneurial campuses are putting too much confidence in hard deal makers. There's lots of evidence about this. The law of big financial gain when faculty members hold equity in companies can have severe consequences. Universities are gaining an unprecedented financial interest in the prosperity of the biomedical industry as a whole. Um, <coughs> commercial agreements with industry consultancies and entrepreneurships create and perpetuate the conditions for conflict of interest. The worst consequences of university venture capital funds would be the loss of universities' academic integrity and institutional independence. And uh, the university's function as an independent social critic 
is particularly important with respect to the biotechnology industry. Just let me close by um, uh, alluding to what I now th uh, uh, think of as famous last words. Uh, one of the famous last words is that it's time to leave the ivory tower, and of course that's what philosophers are doing. Um, the second uh, famous last word is that the university can't be all things to all people, which just strikes me as a red herring. Um, and the, the last uh, famous last word is basically to the effect that until now, everything and everybody have been failures uh, all over the place, and this is a national trend. And it seems to me that the, these uh, slogans and everything else I've been talking about are uh, designed, and there's some reason for it. It's not, it's not entirely uh, motivated by, by evil, but um, it seems to me quite clear that universities are now um, becoming uh, corporate hierarchies, uh, which are in the business of making money and not in the business of higher education. And um, it seems to me that um, this is an extremely dangerous trend. And um, for those of you who don't believe it, I would recommend to you a book called Hitless Professors, which is a book about the way in which uh, um, ac academics in Nazi Germany totally capitulated to the, uh, to the drive to, uh, to make uh, Germany uh, and the Third Reich uh, a world power. And it seems to me that uh, although there are obvious disanalogies, that uh, too many university, uh, I, I, my main belief is that uh, it's the faculty that I blame for this. I mean, I don't blame administrators or board of regents because that's what they get paid for. I think faculty members who are either falling into this greed or who just sit silently by and let this happen uh, are, uh, uh, despite the obvious analogies, doing precisely what uh, Hitler's professors did in the 30s, that is, one either works for the glory of the Third Reich or uh, somebody knocks on your door at 2 o'clock in the morning. We haven't got to that point yet, and I hope we don't, but I think the faculty has to take responsibility for defending and preserving the uh, academic values that we're supposed to be guiding our lives by uh, and not uh, spending all of our time uh, making money. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Next, we'll shift to Reed, and then we'll have an open discussion. Thanks, Reed. I'd like to begin by uh, taking you to late night television when all the uh, commercials are on, paid for an hour or a half an hour, in which the television station comes on either before or after, sometimes both, and says uh, the station assumes uh, no responsibility and the views of this particular program do not, ref do not necessarily reflect those of management. I want to emphasize that I am speaking personally, and as I see my boss sitting in the audience, I, I want to emphasize that these are, uh, these are my personal opinions. I also need to uh, apologize on behalf of uh, Dr. Gadelman. Uh, Pat is, uh, is sick today, and she uh, said that she would not be able to attend. So accordingly, uh, Pat Miller asked me to speak for her today. And in outlining for me, what Pat would like, uh, the subject about what she'd like to have me cover. She'd like to have me talk about the realities of dealing with the issues raised by uh, Dr. Hollinger and uh, Regent Williams. And I would like to do that in the setting of uh, my former roles as a lobbyist and as a legislator and list for you briefly some of the factors that I believe legislators and, and state elected officials have to consider when they uh, consider the role of the university in today's environment. The first of them is that you have to look no further than uh, the change from last year's appropriations year to this year's appropriation year. At the close of last year's uh, legislative session, the promise was made is that be sure you look at certain aspects of your budget because we want you coming back in December, January, and February seeking a supplemental budget request because we're not able to fund some of these issues in 1990, but certainly we'll be able to take care of those in 1991. Less than six months after that, it became increasingly clear that that would not be the reality. So the reality is one of uh, constantly changing financial expectations. Other factors that have to be considered is that the General Assembly is in a 
role of trying to assert itself as an equal branch to that of the governor, whether that ever happens. I, I personally doubt if that will ever happen because it does not have the resources of the executive branch available to it. But as a result, the legislature is in a position of trying to exert greater oversight of the university's budget. This sometimes results in special purpose appropriations to the university. It sometimes results in greater scrutiny of the budgets than would be desired. But it is something of which, with which the universities have to deal. The universities also have to struggle with the fact that we are dealing with a one political party in charge of the executive branch, another political party in charge of the legislative branch. Complicating that is that we have competing interests between the two houses, competing interests, leadership struggles within the houses. Because of these competing forces, we also find ourselves coming up with macro answers to micro problems. And as a result, it causes immense uh, frustration in the part of the university. There's a great deal of skepticism within the state's political leadership of the budgets that exist in the university. You have to put yourself in the position of policymakers for our state. When they look at the budgets for human services or the Department of Natural Resources or any other state department, they, the oversight that they have of those state departments is a FTE budget. They look at each budget position and they say whether that particular budgetary position should be increased, whether, excuse me, whether the cap should be increased for that particular uh, area. Whereas in the regions they have not approached that level of scrutiny, one for which we should be uh, quite thankful. That's, that flexibility also is, uh, uh, causes us concern because of the fact that we do know that we have, because of the way our budgets are set up and the way that they examine our budgets, we do have sources of revenue which other state departments do not have. It's a plus, but yet it's also a minus for us. The state policymakers also have to take into, fact, into account the fact that there's great pride in our regent universities by our citizens. If my uh, brief uh, cursory review of the list of AAU, American Associ Association of American Universities, is correct. There are only four states in this union which have two or more public universities in this prestigious organization, those being the states of Michigan, Indiana, California, and Iowa. That pride is something in which we should all take, um, give thanks for the past and also have to work for the future, such that this reputation is maintained. And I think that pride is exhibited through the way that the individuals in our society, in our state, work with their legislators and state policymakers, indicating that they want our regents, institutions, and higher education in general to be uh, maintained and to be, uh, and to be strengthened. There is a realization, but at the same time, great frustration with the fact that the governance structure of our universities moves slowly, as its very nature of shared governance and, and the primary responsibility being in the faculty come up with recommendations for the administration in so very many important areas of this institution, that there is some frustration with it, but nevertheless they realize the very real importance of this uh, shared governance function responsibility. The legislators and our state policymakers are also under the impression that the key responsibility of these institutions are to is to educate their sons and daughters. And coupled with that education is the fact that education is, has to be taken out into the field, literally and figuratively, and also that we have to remain current and at the leading area of our uh, society in providing knowledge and a research base for our society to develop. Furthermore, our state policymakers, when we look at the role and the reality of this university, we have to recognize we are facing increasing competition, increasing competition for faculty, students, and private support. And finally, I think our policy makers are very well of the fact, very well aware of the fact that this is an institution in which critical ideas are indeed shared. It causes immense frustration when a state public official will come out and criticize, uh, come out and, excuse me, suggest that less red meat should be consumed, but nevertheless they recognize that that frustration is caused by the very real importance of academic responsibility, academic freedom, and the area that the university is an area for an exchange of critical thoughts. 
It's an, it's an institution in which a member of this community can feel comfortable in calling a state political leader a yo-yo. Nevertheless, it causes immense frustration, but nevertheless, it goes on in this state. It is a dynamic with, for which we should be thankful, one with which the state political leaders must deal, and one of the realities in which we must examine as we look at the role of the university in today's society. Thank you very much, Reed. Let's go right into questions, comments from the floor. We have about a good 20 minutes. Yes. Yeah, this is for Mr. Um, you mentioned something about the fact that a lot of legislatures are wanting to get into the act of deciding how the universities spend their money. And I was I'm wondering if the university is trying to do anything to counteract that, because I can see the reason why a lot of legislatures have done that, and that's the fact that um, a lot of the universities are going through year appropriate creations right now, and most of the universities show their cuts coming to the end. Have you got the question? I think so, and if not, you can tell me otherwise. First of all, I think the, necess the, the tension, the friction between and among various institutions of, of higher education is natural and it's not necessary ba necessarily bad. And I think that is important because it keeps the universities in a setting in which we, are, we recognize we are public servants and we have a trust that we must maintain. And so I think that is very good. But I think the way that we've approached this budget problem to follow through on your uh, question is one in which we've said some reversions are going to occur in 1991, the budget in which we are, in which we are operating right now. And we are going to operate the best we can in coming up with some short-term solutions. If the budget is such in 19, fiscal year 1992 for the year 1991-92 is such as we look at it right now, there are going to have to be some reductions. Some people call them deappropriations. Some people call them uh, cutbacks. Whatever they may be called, we will be accomplishing those through deferred maintenance. We'll be accomplishing those through uh, not filling positions. We'll be accomplishing those through reduction of services. But that will be going on. People are not being filled in not only in the faculty area, but also in the staff area. It is, uh, but we have hoped that we would not have to be laying people off up until this point, but there may come a time, if indeed the cuts are severe enough, that reductions will have to occur. Mary, would you like to join in on that question? Well, I think that there is always uh, criticism of where cuts come when they come. It's always easier to add money than it is to take it away. And I think when you realize that the percentage of the budget that goes toward personnel of all sorts, whether it be faculty or staff or administration, uh, is the is the vast majority of the budget. It's very difficult to make any cuts without affecting every affected uh, group of employees, whether they be administrators or faculty. Now the faculty and, and staff are the largest by far in terms of numbers of people that are employed by the institutions. And so when cuts come and when resignations occur, they're more likely to incur in terms of the numbers in those large number groups. And so that's why you see uh, us not filling faculty positions. But if those same types of things occur in administration, and they do, and probably proportionately, those cuts occur also. I know that in the, in the board office this year, um, the staff that serves the regents and the institutions, um, we've had some very major cuts, and if they go through as have been proposed, we are going to be in serious trouble because and because those people aren't going to be there to do the support work that we need to be to have done in order to make the right kinds of decisions for the institutions. So administrators are being cut too, and as are the support staff. And it's very difficult when when you you are a student or you're a faculty member and you're seeing your compatriots or your teachers going by the wayside, but it's happening all over the institutions. And hopefully the strategic planning that we have in place will help us 
make those cuts in a way that doesn't detour us from achieving the, the strategic plan in the long run. Uh, these short-term problems really pose some serious uh, problems for the attainment of our strategic goals. Bob? Yeah, uh, there, there, there is a, a well, one, one sort of theory about, about this, and it may have, it's debatable, but uh, I guess I like it, is that one can look at the history of, uh, of deregulation in this country since our beloved uh, uh, King Ronald was president, and uh, it's certainly arguable that one of the reasons why Reagan and Bush uh, cut back money from education is to drive universities into the arms of, of corporate America uh, on the grounds that that's the only way uh, in which universities could get money. For it. And the history, uh, the history of this rise of the corporate university is certainly consistent with the idea that uh, universities, uh, starting with Harvard and Stanford, uh, began um, sleeping with corporations on a huge scale precisely because the federal government began cutting back money to, to uh, universities. I mean, it seems to me uh, that we ought to think about the fact that the United States is now spending hundreds of billions do of dollars on bombs and missiles uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, and we're talking here about uh, universities not having enough money to pay for toilet paper on campus. So I would think about that for a while. Yes. Yeah, in a uh, time where we continue to hear about reversions and the lack of filling of positions, um, I become very concerned that we, uh, well, first of all, I, I've heard a number of rumors this year that McCandless is leaving and don't bring it up that he's still on the staff as a vice president at probably a salary of $130,000 a year. He's a person who came at the request of President Eaton. I don't know that he met with the approval of any faculty member or any group other than probably the region, regents and Eaton. And um, I think that at a time when we have to um, 